My guest today shares a story that is all too common for so many women. It's the story of discovering her husband's marital betrayal. This is part one of our conversation. We talk about what does a woman do when she is in the early stages of her journey. We talk about how God sustains women. And what about the woman who decides to stay? If you or someone you know has walked through marital betrayal, would you be willing to share this episode with them? I think Stephanie's words will be a source of strength, comfort, and encouragement. Hi, friend. You're listening to Find Hope Here. I'm your host, Teresa Whiting, author, speaker, ministry leader, friend, and fellow struggler. This is a podcast about the messy, complicated, painful parts of life, but also the beautiful, joy-filled hope that Jesus promises. Each week, we dig deep into God's Word together and talk about how His truth impacts our everyday lives. I'm not going to ask you to sit with me and have coffee because I seem to have my best conversations while I'm just doing life. So I'd love to hang out with you as you walk or fold laundry or drive to work. You're invited to join me in pursuing the hope God promises. No matter where you are or where you've been, I pray you always find hope here. Let's jump in to today's episode. Hello, friends. Today, I am introducing you to Stephanie Brorsma. Stephanie is not unfamiliar with crushing disappointment. She is passionate about helping and coaching women pursue Christ while chasing wholeness and healing after her marital betrayal. Stephanie comes alongside women to provide resources and encouragement as they walk their infidelity journey. Her approachable and transparent style makes her a safe person to confide in. Stephanie enjoys coaching and has led hundreds of reclaimed groups for over a decade. She's the author of Reclaimed, Finding Your Identity After Marital Betrayal. When she's not writing content or meeting brides, Stephanie delights in being a wife, mother, auntie, and friend. Her therapy is gardening or a run through the Pacific Northwest trails. Stephanie and her husband, Tim, of over 20 years, live in the Northwest pocket of Washington State with their four children. So Stephanie, welcome. I am so honored to have you on the podcast today. And as we begin, maybe you can just tell us a little bit more about who you are and what you do. Yeah, well, you pretty much just did that for me. So yeah, we're good. No. <laughs> All right. No, I am. Um... You know, I have lived in this little corner of the world for my entire life. And so my my life seems simple to a lot of people, but it's not. Um, my husband and I have been married for 21 years. Like you said, we have four kids. Our oldest is 19 and our youngest is eight. Uh, in high school, I had my life planned out. I was going to be a hairstylist. I went to beauty school. I got my cosmetology degree. Um, six months after we were married, my husband bought me a salon and I turned into a salon owner, did that for a couple of years. And then our first baby came along. Uh, currently my cosmetology license is expired and I cut our family's hair in our garage. So that's the update. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yes. I love that. We all kind of think we have our plans and then God totally reroutes them. So yes, he does. I can relate to that. Just to kind of get into the topic for today, and this is a this is a heavy topic, and it's something that so many women have walked through and are walking through right now. Yeah. And I know that you walked a heartbreaking path that you are now using to help other women. So would you be willing um, to share as much of your story as you're comfortable with? Yeah. So like I said, we've been married for 21 years, but year seven, um, you know, you go into marriage and they're like, watch out for that seven year itch. And whatever it was, uh, seven years came around and my husband came home um, and just had a blindside confession to um, a decade long pornography addiction, which mm -hmm. had led to multiple affairs. And 
I was not prepared to receive that news. I have had hair clients sit in my chair and tell me the stories. And I would always go home thinking, thank God that's not my story. And then it was. And I remember receiving a confession. And it's kind of an out of body experience that you're having because you're hearing words, but then all of a sudden they just kind of turn into this mumble jumble and you're just going, what's happening? Who is this? Who is that? What, what is going on? And I felt this warm impression of the Holy spirit just say it is well. And I needed that in that moment, Teresa, like I needed to know that whatever chaos is, you know, swirling around me right now, like God's got me. And because of my faith journey, because I, you know, I grew up in the faith, our parents brought us to church twice on Sunday. Um, I really had not been exposed to a lot of worldly views. It had been very protected. Um, it, betrayal and infidelity was always something that would happen to other people, but never in my marriage because mm -hmm. we go to church and we pray and I read my Bible and I'm devoted to God. So there's no space in my marriage for this type of sin to be present. And then when it was, it the only thing that had not betrayed me was my faith in Jesus Christ. And it was the only thing that sustained me throughout. It's been 14 years now through recovery. Wow. You know, when you're telling that story, I, I feel the impact in my body. I just feel like oh, to, to have that revelation and to know what it feels like. And, you know, you mentioned this was not supposed to be my story. And then it was, I don't know a woman who would say, you know, I, I thought that might happen. I mean, along the way, there might be suspicions, but when it actually happens, when you get that revelation, the, the impact and the shock yeah. of it is just yeah. unbelievable. And I know that there's women right now that are, that are in the early stages. And some of them may, like you, they may have felt the Holy Spirit saying it is well. And some mm -hmm. of them might just feel like they've been run over by a truck and they don't feel like it's well. I mean, how do you help women who are in the beginning stages of this journey? Yeah. I think the number one thing that was beneficial to me was to pause and pray. And I'm not saying that you um, need to be like, stop the confession right now. Whatever discover discovery I just stumbled upon, I'm just going to like close the phone and the computer. I'm just going to get on my knees and pray. It was more of a like, dear God, you need to help me through this. It was a plea with God, not necessarily some eloquent prayer. Uh, but I did go to church. Uh, he said everything and I got my shoes on and I'm like, I'm going for a walk. And so I went to church and it was there that a really good friend of mine, a life coach and mentor, she caught me and she helped walk with me through those first few hours of the shock and the adrenaline starting to wear off. And then that night, our pastor, he um, he had said, you need to ask him to leave. You need some separation. I was like, no, like I vow till death do us part. I didn't say like till, you know, I, I, I do until you betray me and you are unfaithful. And then I'm going to ask you to leave. Like I could not physically ask my husband to leave the house. So our pastor did. And so pause and pray is definitely number one. And in that moment, you're praying for God. Give me the people, give me the tangible body of Christ that I need to partner with to get through these initial stages and hours of confession. And then as it starts to progress and you may be a week or two post-discovery, you really want to look and see what tools and resources do you already have that can help you process? And then what tools and resources do you need? Uh, depending on what the outcome is, what your direction is, uh, restoration was definitely something I wanted to partner with. I wanted to work towards healing. I still loved my husband. And that thought alone was so confusing. How can I love this person who has betrayed our complete existence as a couple? That was so confusing. So I needed to partner with the clinical um, 
approach to healing. I needed to partner with counselors, partner with specialists who could help in the betrayal healing, as did my husband. Uh, But my main counselor was the Holy Spirit. There is a balance between the two, the clinical and the Holy Spirit. And so I would I would tell that bride, um, pause and pray, and then decide what tools do you need, what resources do you not have, and then go after them. Uh, Psalm 91 is the prayer protection. And I absolutely love Psalm 91. If you haven't read it, underline the entire thing. But um Like the first, the first verse, he who dwells in the shelter of the most high will rest in the shadow of the almighty. We have permission to pause and pray. We have permission to rest and to crawl up into God's shelter and just process what just happened. Yeah, I love that. And I think, doesn't it say something about being under his wings in that passage? Yes. Yes. I remember walking through a, a difficult season and having that psalm that was one of my go-to psalms and i would literally get in bed at night and i would wrap the covers around me and i would say i'm under his wings i'm under his wings like knowing almost like a a physical feeling of i know i'm under god's wings i'm under i'm under his protection and um i think that is a fabulous psalm and I, i also just appreciate the really practical things you're telling women because sometimes you just don't even know what what you need to do. And so Mm -hmm. you're giving really solid practical steps of, okay, pause and pray, pick up the tools, discover what tools do you even need? Get help, get counsel, Mm -hmm. you know, have people around you that can guide and direct your next steps when you're kind of just still, still in a state of shock, maybe a little bit. Yeah. And shock lasts for a while. I mean, I, didn't eat for 10 days. My body was in complete shock, which is why I needed to have space. I needed the physical space. I needed the emotional space to process what just happened. And a lot of women have what we refer to as a trickle discovery, where it's that slow drippy faucet of, you know, oh, you caught him in this line. You caught him in that line. You have a little bit of this truth, a little bit of that truth. I had the full fire hose confession. It was everything up front. And so that definitely puts you into a state of shock. So you need to sit with that and tell your body, our God-given nervous system, which our father has created, until that is in a state of regulation, you can't really process anything. So you have to sit in that for a while. I appreciate that. I appreciate you talking about our bodies because I have read and often recommended the book, The Body Keeps the Score. And I so think good. about how we in the church, I don't think have really acknowledged that or talked much about the fact that trauma hits our bodies and it affects our bodies. And we don't really know how to work through it. And even yeah. when I first heard um, the term like, well, how do you self-regulate? I was like, what is that? What does that even mean? I don't even, I never even heard that yeah. term before. So the fact that you're mentioning getting to a place of regulation, yeah. um, is really important. And yeah, if you don't know what that means, your counselor does, or yes. you can also get the book, The Body Keeps the Score, which I highly recommend. But you know, that's yeah. it's oh. becoming more well known. Did you want to say something about it that? Is. Yeah. So uh, some practical things. If you are not sleeping at night, go get yourself a weighted blanket. You know, it, tell yourself, I'm under the shelter of God's wings and his wings are heavy because he carries a lot, right? So get yourself a weighted blanket because that's going to give your nervous system the the intake that it needs just to calm those nerves down. Make sure you're drinking water. Like I said, I didn't eat for 10 days, but my mom still made sure I drank some water. (laughs) So you can sustain yourself on water alone. Um, You know, make sure you're getting some fresh air. Your body needs that. Your mind needs that renewal, the fresh air to kind of shock yourself out of that trauma of like, Oh, it's cold outside. You know, some of those things, right? There's a lot of practical steps that you can go through to help process the trauma of it. But the way to blanket is a big thing. I love that. And I love that you mentioned water and fresh air, like all the things that God created for yes. us, you know, breathing, deep breaths, all of that is like things that He created to help us, to help our bodies, which are connected to our souls and our hearts and our minds. 
And I know you mentioned that it was your relationship with Jesus that sustained you. If you want to say a little bit more about what sustained you in this process, or maybe what scriptures, in addition to Psalm 91, have been a lifeline for you. You know, I... I don't know if you could see this, but Psalm 77 is the scripture that every single word is underlined and highlighted. Um, Psalm 77, we we see the psalmist who's, he says the first verse is, I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out entirely hands, like my soul refused to be comforted. There was a point in my grief where I just was in the fetal position crying for days on end because I'm trying to process and intake like what just happened, the reality of my marriage. Like I didn't have red flags. I didn't see any of this coming. So it was such a shock to my heart and to just the the reality of like, how do I even trust myself? How do I trust myself with my decisions? Because I couldn't even I didn't even see this coming. Like I should have known better. Right. And so Mm. you immediately just like all forms of trauma, all forms of distress. And I felt like I was the psalmist who's just, instead of stretched out on the floor, I was in the fetal position, rocking myself back and forth, just crying out like, God, how did I get here? And then there's a point in that, in that chapter Uh, He says, then I thought to this, I will appeal the years of the right hand of the most high verse 11. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. This image of a rear view mirror was so apparent to me during this time, because as I'm screaming at God, I'm wrestling with the idea of, do I forgive him or do I not? Like, how could you be such a good God? And yet these things happen because simultaneously my dad and sister were fighting cancer journeys of their own. Mm. So I'm struggling with the grief of that. And then I have betrayal. And so it's never just one thing that a bride is processing. You know, it's not in this world, you will have a trouble, check that box, and now you can cruise freely. No, there's always something additional to it. And so there was multiple journeys of grief that I was trying to process. And that image of the rear view mirror, I was like, okay, God, like the only way I'm going to get through this is I need to remember, I need to remember, I need to remember. And I looked back and I saw how God was faithful to me in the past, how he was faithful to me in other situations. And that was reassurance that he was going to be faithful for my future as well. So that was really a kind of a transitional point in my healing journey. And that really was what sustained me was Psalm 77. I read that over and over and over again, you know, cranking up the worship music. I just needed anything that was going to infuse hope and infuse life into my soul. That's what I went to. I love that God's word sustained you because he says that he promises that his Mm -hmm. word is life to us and that it restores us. And then to hear in this story how it it, that's true. Like he's not making this up. It really does sustain us in our darkest yeah. days. You mentioned that you felt like I should have seen this coming and, and you couldn't trust yourself. And talk a little bit about that. What was that like for you in your journey as far as beating yourself up and feeling like, oh, I should have known better? One of the first things I said to my husband after he was done confessing is, what could I have done? What, what could I, what can I do better? And I've realized through counseling and a lot of obtaining, you know, tools and resources that I'm a codependent. I am your best people pleaser. And I would do anything to avoid conflict. I would walk on eggshells. I would avoid hard conversations just so that I didn't have to create an enemy. And in doing so, I lost part of this beautiful thing that God has given us, and that's our voice. And so when, when I'm listening to the words of, I've had multiple affairs and I'm struggling with this addiction, immediately I was unaware that I was a codependent at this time. So I retreated to that, like, oh, I need a people, please. I need to fix this. How, how can I fix this? What do I need to do to make this right? And it was like immediate, those lies from the enemy just attached to my soul. And the lies of, you're not a good, 
you're not a good wife. You're not even a good friend. How can you be a good friend when you've missed all this? So it was these, these lies attached to my soul and then the shame. And then you wrestle with like, I shouldn't be the one feeling shame. My husband should be the one feeling shame. But because of how the enemy just twists everything, he sees everything as an opportunity. And my weakness immediately was this shredded self-esteem and a shattered view of my identity. And that's where the, the not trusting and the not seeing me as God's child, I was seen, I was viewing myself as a broken child of God, somebody not worthy enough of healing. And um, that, that was hard. I wrestled with that so often. And so one phrase that I say now, like I said, this is 14 years of recovery, active recovery. Um, the phrase that I say to myself now when, when one of those lies starts to attach, and I've done a lot of processing, a lot of heart work to remove the lies, but they're still present, um, is I just say, this is not the voice of my father. Hmm. And when you... When you accept Jesus Christ into your life, you are given that authority to speak over the lies. You are given the authority and you partner with the Holy Spirit to win those spiritual battles. So absolutely to the bride who's wrestling with the lies that say, you're not enough. You're not skinny enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not sexy enough. You, you, all of the enough lies. This is not the voice of my father. That's the, that is like the number one battle cry that you need to get in the habit of saying. That is so beautiful. And it's, it's something I love to give people phrases like latch onto this, speak it out loud, whether it's a, a phrase from the scripture or something like that. that. That's just something that I think is so powerful. And you said, that you lost your voice or you're rediscovering your voice. And you also mentioned that it's been 14 years. You know, you're you're way down the road on this journey. But I hear that it's still a journey. You never get to the end of the road and tie the bow on top and be like, done, we're good. Everything's fine. I'm perfectly fine. Like there's still challenges and still growth. Yeah. Well, I mean, no journey is perfect. So our story involves relapse. We've had slips. Um, there's been struggles for, you know, in my husband's story where it's caused us to go back to the beginning. You know, we had out of home separation, we've had in home separation. We've had almost every detail aside from emotional affair in our story. And we've not stopped partnering with the clinical and spiritual components. Our toolbox is so full, but I'm committed because, you know, talking about a voice, um, I, I still like, I just get the goosebumps thinking of that impression of it is well, it is well, but I, there's also another voice that has said, please stay. And this voice from God that has just begged me to stay for 14 years. And there's a lot of women who wrestle and say like, they, they're quick to just jump out. And that chase for happiness is what the world wants us to do. There's so many outside opinions that say you could, you could do better. You could go find better. Go, go chase your happiness. Go seek something else. Like this isn't worth it. This is going to be too hard. It's going to be too messy. So don't invest into restoration. But God, for whatever reason, saw that I did still love my husband. I do still love my husband. And I want this to work. And there's points in our story where I'm like, there's no way. I have no idea how, God. This can only be you. And so it's been 14 years of God saying, please stay. And so I stay well. You know, Stephanie, I, I think that that is, it's a beautiful choice and a really hard choice that you're making. And I know that there are women who decide to stay. They say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to stick with this marriage. Yes. Biblically speaking, I could walk away. I have that option. Um. And then they choose to stay. And sometimes I think those women are criticized or ostracized for that kind of decision. What would you say to the woman who says, I'm choosing to stay and my family doesn't like it. My friends don't like mm -hmm. it. Everybody thinks I'm an idiot. 
Yeah. That's a hard one because there are a lot of women who are in that position where the opinions are so loud. And sometimes those opinions start to become louder than the voice of our father. Um, but there's a second phrase that I like to say, and it's, this is not the will of my father. And the will of my father has asked me to stay in our marriage. And that's a vertical conversation between God and me. It involves nobody else. And so for the bride who is seeking restoration and whose husband has partnered with restoration, and they're doing this together, any outside opinion that is against the will of their father, you first off do not need to defend it because your marriage is, involves two people, <laughs> you and your spouse. It does not involve the opinions of man or the extended family who's going, you're going to what? You're going to stay? You're going to do what? Um, so I, I would not encourage to step into that argument or into that conversation, but you can just say the will of my father has asked me to stay. So I'm going to stay well. And I need your support. I need your prayer support and your encouragement. And if not, I need you just to respect it quietly from a distance. That's really helpful. And I know this is, you know, what you're saying is this is your choice. Would you ever tell a woman? you need to go, like you need to step away. You need to divorce him. Is there a situation where you would counsel somebody that way or coach somebody in that direction? Yeah. And I have multiple times and I, it just devastates me because I don't like that. I, I want everybody to have their happily ever after, but I know that's not, that's not possible in a, in a fallen world. And so um, what I will often say to a gal is, the, the restoration journey involves two people, husband and wife. And if, they're, if the spouse is not willing to get on board and partner with the Holy Spirit in that journey and refusing to repent, refusing, you know, t- there's no signs of remorse. Um, if that is present and they're still active in that addiction or affair, that's typically when I start to encourage to walk down the path of a biblical divorce because you're not, you can't force somebody to change. You can't force somebody to feel bad about their choice. It has to be a personal conviction. And if your spouse is not feeling that, um, you know, I think remorse takes some time. Uh, repentance is not like, oh, hey, by the way, I just had this affair. I'm so sorry. And they actually mean it. It takes time for the Holy Spirit to work in them for that to be an authentic change, to be an authentic um, posture of repentance. So if it's been one month and you're not seeing a lot of change, I would, again, go back to pause and pray. God, show me the direction you want me to go. Um, If it becomes six months and you still don't see change, Mm, I might question some things. Um, sometimes it's sooner, right? Everybody has their own timeline. But the, the biggest thing is if you're not seeing a, a heart condition where your spouse is repentant and feeling the remorse and the weight of what their decisions were, if they're not willing to partner with restoration and to Um, to be okay with those set boundaries and transparency and meeting with the clinical toolbox, right? Meeting with a therapist, you know, getting EMDR. Um, Some people need, you know, more addiction um, therapy. If they're not willing to partner with that, it's going to be really hard to find restoration. And so that's when I would, would start talking about a biblical divorce. I appreciate that. And I think women who are listening who might be in that situation appreciate that and just know that there is that 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 is an option like you said restoration takes two people and if yeah you're the only one working toward restoration then you are free you do not have to stay in a situation where a husband doesn't want to reconcile doesn't want to like as you said partner with the holy spirit which is critical so sorry to break in and interrupt this conversation, but we will be back next week to continue it. In the meanwhile, why don't you check out Stephanie's book, Reclaimed, Finding Your Identity After Marital Betrayal. 
Of course, I'll have a link in the show notes. And while you're on Amazon, if you would stop by Graced, How God Redeems and Restores the Broken and leave your five-star rating and review, that would mean so much to me. Thanks, friends, and we'll see you next week when we continue our conversation. Thanks for hanging out with me today on Find Hope Here. To find anything I mentioned on the episode, go to teresawhiting.com slash listen to find all the show notes. I'd like to leave you with this prayer from Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope.